Let's get started. Welcome everyone to Health Action Network Society's webinar series, Thriving Through It. My name is Nada and I'm the General Manager of Health Action Network Society, or as it's often known, HANS. Uh, today, we're very, very pleased to present Dr. Patrick Callis on Got the Pandemic Blues, You're Not Alone. Dr. Patrick Callis is a naturopathic doctor who graduated from the Boucher Institute of Naturopathic Medicine in New Westminster, BC. Upon graduation in 2012, he was awarded the BINM Spirit Award for his outstanding community involvement. He is the president and co-founder of Psy Integrated Health Inc., whose mission is to create a network of thriving community-owned clinics across North America. Patrick practices at Empower Health and has provided telemedicine services to his patients long before the COVID pandemic. Patrick is also a clinical instructor for the Boucher Institute of Naturopathic Medicine and practice educator for the UBC Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Patrick's clinical focuses are anxiety, depression, PTSD, brain health, mold toxicity, optimal aging, and cancer care. He is a member of the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Dr. Patrick will take questions after his presentation and please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen if you do have a question. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the Health Action Network Society website at hans.org. So welcome and I'll hand it over to Patrick. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you for having me and thank you for the great introduction. Uh, thank you to Hans, um, which I'm proud to be a board member of. Uh, just because everyone's coming from different places, acknowledging it's kind of an afternoon, maybe uh, from those around me anyways, it's a bit of a bit of a week. So I invite everyone before I get going uh, to take a deep breath, three in fact with me. If you're someone who's a jaw clencher or has a lot of tension, I'll invite you to put the to your tongue to the top of the roof of your mouth during these breaths. And I want you to just take a breath in, mainly through your nose. You can open your mouth a little bit too, but again, tongue, top, roof of mouth. Big breath in with me. Holding and then slowly out. Try and do at least three or four seconds in. Pause for a few seconds at the top, then out again. I think this is the biggest breath, the next one that you've had all day. And now this third one, and now the biggest breath you've had all day. Air is filling your stomach. Not really, but your stomach's expanding. And out we go. And one more, four. Great. Feel where you are. Don't be mind the distract any distracting sounds. Notice your seat. Notice where you are. Notice your surroundings. And just gently, we're going to hop into this. So the topic today has got the pandemic blues. You're not alone. I will mainly be focusing on depression, but from a naturopathic perspective, anxiety and depression um, have many common root causes and certainly solutions together too, which we'll get through during the talk today. So thank you for all for being here. There we go. Go. So we're going to talk about some symptoms and stats about uh, depression, and anxiety uh, in the frame of the current pandemic that we're exiting out of gradually. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some causes of anxiety, depression beyond the pandemic, uh, and then some solutions. So things you could start right now. Uh, at home, gone the deep breathing we already did, which hopefully helped a little bit uh, you, and certainly would need to be adopted as a regular practice. If you like that breathing, I suggest that's something you do uh, when you wake up first thing in the morning uh, and when you go to bed at night and also transitions to the day, you know, at the end of a work day or just getting home, it's good to have that. And the more you do it, the more you cast votes to calm your nervous system down and be present. Uh, and sometimes 
there'll be resistance, there'll be thoughts. It's not gonna clear everything and make your life better instantly, but it's casting votes in the direction towards your nervous system being more peaceful and, and your mood being a little bit better, just taking those deep life-affirming breaths in like we did at the start. So let's hop to it. Again, you're not alone. So some symptoms of depression in particular, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but um, I think the key things here that really set depression, like clinical or significant depression aside from just sort of a run of the mill, more low mood uh, is a sense of overwhelm, that there are both, that there are physical symptoms uh, in the mix there. So like poor concentration at the top or restlessness, um, eating, pains, aches and pains, or cramps that won't go away, digestive upset, which is also common. Uh, those pieces, the physical symptoms could be common, very common to anxiety. Often people feel anxiety in their gut. It's very common. Uh, the reason for that is that you know, our, our second brain is in our, our gut, which we'll get to a little bit more later, but besides your brain and your spinal cord, the most nerves in our body are in our digestive tract. So it is really a highly innervated place, intimately linked to how we're feeling, what we're thinking. Uh, and the other piece to depression is that it's been going on for, for months. It's not just a couple of days or a week, it, it is persistent. And it's not to say you can't have a depressed or low mood that we want to you know, take some action with um, that is shorter than that, but just uh, signs of actual depression and also sign you, if you're not already having it, if you're feeling depressed yourself or wondering if you're depressed, uh, to seek additional support because uh, that's something that has been a big issue during this pandemic, that the isolation uh, and loneliness has been really enhanced and that makes anxiety and depression worse, which I'll get into more as we go along here. So some of the stats here, uh, don't expect you all necessarily be able to read this, but uh, this was from American stats that uh, you know certainly generally can be echoed into Canada, showing the average, first upper right one there is average share of adults reporting symptoms of anxiety disorder and or depressive disorder. Uh, from January to June 2019 versus January 2021. Uh, you'll notice there's a significant difference. Only 11% was the national average in the US uh, before the pandemic began in, uh, in 2019, well, before it began in 2019. And now as of this January, up to 41%, so more than about almost four times. That's a pretty significant increase. And uh, the next slide, the one over to the right, upper right hand there is showing percents of anxiety, depression, and then combinations. The majority at 41.1% is a combination of anxiety and depression combined. And uh, anxiety is a little bit higher there by standalone anxiety is a little bit higher through about 35.8% and depression lowest but present by, by itself about 28.4%. So what that tells us is that there is a certainly a combination of anxiety and depression or anxiety that is dominating here. Um, and from my, my own experience of depression is um, personally is I don't tend to get depressed in any significant prolonged way unless I've had prolonged anxiety that has um, burnt me out and thus freed up my nervous system and then I get depression. So we're seeing quite a combination of them. And it may be something to consider if you more closely associate with anxiety uh, and you've been experiencing that or new symptoms of it over this pandemic then uh, you may want to consider that depression has also started to creep in. If it was it's new to you like a, it uh, used to be to me. Um, so something for you to consider. And then last here that I think is really interesting, something we should all be aware of is who's being impacted in by age groups. Uh, the furthest left age group in the bottom left graph is adults age, age 18 to 28. Uh, and then we get 25 to 49, 50 to 64, and then 65 plus. And while all groups are have a significant uh, you know, are significantly represented. It's the youngest group, those 18 to 24 year olds that have a 56% share of depressive anxiety or depressive disorder during the pandemic, followed by adults 24 to 49 at 48.9%. Um, and that sort of goes down from there. And I would say that part of that is certainly due to job loss and, and security um, that goes along with being in those age groups more so than uh, adults who are more secure in their position later on in life or that uh, or even ret retired uh, and sorry if that link there is hard to read I can send that along I didn't realize it was called the white text there uh, note there is that I said there's been a strong correlation between job and or house loss and anxiety and depression not surprisingly but thought it worth pointing out so let's talk to some good old Canadian stats eh? uh, the second wave this is from UBC faculty of medicine um, I'll read the first part aloud for anyone 
uh, just for emphasis and for anyone who has difficulty reading it. Second wave of the pandemic has intensified feelings of stress and anxiety, causing alarming levels of despair, suicidal thoughts, and hopelessness in the Canadian population. Uh, and they point out the great uh, concern is a sharp increase in suicidality this fall, meaning this fall 2020. Um, the one in 10 Canadians experiencing recent thoughts or feelings of suicide with up from up from 6% in the spring and 2.5% pre-pandemic. So again, about a four times increase from pre-pandemic times. And of course, important to note too, and be aware that if you or anyone you know is part of some of the more vulnerable uh, subgroups, uh, those include the LGBTQ2 plus group, uh, anyone with existing mental health issues, uh, anyone with a disability. And again, those younger age groups here, there's pointing out 18 years to 34 with two different percents there, but both being roughly 20% and, and the indigenous population. So, you know, if there's already, you know, increased stress, pressure, lack of support there, there's there at greater risk or greater vulnerability during this pandemic, which makes sense having more pressure on. It's difficult for everyone. And just a quick little note, I like to always say about depression, that I think it's really important here. I'm talking about clinical depression primarily, uh, and it's, it is different than sadness, grief, or melancholy, although those can be code words for depression. Depression, again, here is something more severe, has an overwhelm, is longer standing. And as a naturopath, of course, if you're starting to trend that way or not used to feeling these, these low mood feelings, uh, let's be preemptive and avoid it becoming uh, actual diagnosable or clinical depression. Um, seasonal affective disorder is a little different, but is certainly going to make this all worse. I, um, I've certainly myself felt and had lots of people say when the sun came out here in Vancouver anyway for the last few weeks, like there is this real change, this real change in mentality from this is going on so long. I've told burnout about this, this pandemic. I don't, I'm tired of it all to like the sun hit significantly for a few weeks and everyone was sort of feeling like, Oh, there's hope. The vaccines are coming. I just feel like this is finally starting to shift. You know, there's there's this real sense of hopefulness. Hopefulness and the seasonal affective disorder is uh, low mood felt during winter months, uh, partly from lack of vitamin D uh, because we need sunshine to convert. Uh, vitamin D in our body to its active form, which is a mood lifter and actually helps with muscle muscle well being and reducing fatigue there as well. So it has a very physical uh, impact as well as impacts on our brain. Um, uh, but seasonal affective disorder by itself is not the same as depression. It doesn't in itself tend to get as, as severe, but it's certainly if you're prone to it, you'd be more prone to depression. So that's something to be aware of. So let's hop into causes. Some of these root causes are so some of these are going to be more contributing factors. They may not themselves be a cause, but they just can, you know, they add up to be part of the cause. And some of these themselves could be the cause. I've highlighted three things here as causes of, of depression that I want us to take a close look at. Everything here is, is important, but I really think that things that might be new to you uh, and that I want to explore with a little bit more focus are inflammation causing depression, often something we think of as contained in our head and being more like about mindset and mental control, but there can actually be a very significant systemic cause, which will tie into gut problems when we talk about that. Uh, and then let's talk about secondary to other illnesses and causes there. Uh, it's a bit of a catch-all uh, subject, so I'll talk about some medications uh, and even environmental pollutants that could be a, a triggering factor that we should be aware of and consider exploring, especially for someone who's suffered from depression and find that it's persistent or it's come out of nowhere uh, beyond the pandemic or has uh, made it worse by the pandemic, um, uh, then we should really think about other causes and always think about them and not just accept depression. Is it come out of nowhere and has no other cause? There may be some pieces we can unpack and improve that may be uh, contributing or, or the causative factor. We'll talk really briefly about genetics, which is a really big topic, but I just briefly talk about that there. And then the one that I wanna really focus on is social isolation, which has been a major issue with the pandemic. You know, we are in an era that uh, we've been told to stay inside and not gather and as social creatures and beings, that's really tough. And it's great we have video technology now that you know they didn't have back in the, the old flu, flu pandemic, flu, old flu pandemic in the 1900s. But um, I think it also can sometimes give the illusion of being more connected, 
than it than than it is to be in person. So um, sometimes it can be a bit misleading and make us, I think, add add to things. Although it's overall, it's great that we can still you know connect over phones and video and and have that over compared to little or no contact if we didn't have those technologies. But um, this is a really really key piece here that we're social beings and uh, our social networks and and just ways of operating has been really disrupted. I mean, we now have a whole new phrases like social distancing. Uh, that have uh, not existed before, and that comes with a whole uh, social understanding and context, and how to, how to, how do you apply that? How do people around you apply that? That's a lot to take in. There's stressors that can add to anxiety or depression uh, because it can just be a lot to take in. So, let's talk a little bit about poor sleep. Anyone here had poor sleep during this pandemic? I know I've had a a few nights um, that have been enhanced by circumstances. Uh, of uh, the pandemic. So it can be a real vicious cycle. And you know, when you fall fall into a bad sleep pattern, whether it's difficulty falling asleep or, or waking up or repeatedly waking up in the night, um, if, it, if it happens enough times over time, it can become a pattern, a very unwanted pattern that could be a bit harder to break. But it is really important. Mood, both anxiety and depression, is really linked to sleep and just brain health in general is, is linked to good sleep. Um, and we really do need a good seven to nine hours of it for anyone subsisting on less consistently. That's something I invite you to, to consider taking a look at and reframing. It's, it feels like there's a badge of honor. Sometimes people like, I sleep five hours, I sleep six hours, and they feel like it's something they're really great at doing. And it's not to say that maybe there are rare exceptions where there are very few, very few individuals who actually can be rested and optimized uh, with a little less than the average. But I'd say for most of us, seven, to nine hours of sleep is ideal. And that'll depend on you, your age, and um, yeah, just you know what, what amount of sleep you know tends to make you feel rested and, and ready to go. Sleep is when we repair the body, when the nervous system stores memory. So it doesn't take long, for instance, for, of disrupted sleep to start having difficulty remembering things that we've learned recently, because it really starts to impair us as a real solid physical uh, example. All it takes is a few nights of significant sleep disruption and our uh, our reflexes become like that of someone who's drunk. Just from a few nights of significant sleep disruption. Um, that's that's pretty big. So you can imagine the mental impact that is playing. It's not very not very good. And so sleep is something we definitely want to focus on and improve. And, you know, uh, there's lots we can talk about there later. One thing that sleep does, sleep disruption does too, is it steals serotonin. Serotonin is a neurochemical, so a brain communication molecule that makes us feel kind of satiated, calm. It's what a lot of medications, like say the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, like Paxil, for instance, and then the vaccine and lots of them that are usually used in anxiety and for more moderate depression. And they, what they do is they recycle your body's own serotonin levels. So they, in effect, use the serotonin you have and allow it to hang around longer so that you can use it. And so what happens if you have sleep debt is to build melatonin, which is the sleep hormone our body needs to help trigger and induce sleep and repair at night, it will borrow serotonin from our body so it steals it melatonin and serotonin have similar sounding last names because they can be they're a bit they're related in that way so we want to be able to support both those things so through good sleep uh, and possibly some serotonin energetic supports which i will talk about later so sleep is really crucial the biggest thing i would say about it is the setting of sleep is really important what is your bedroom like is it it tends to be dark, quiet. There's not animals waking you up all throughout the night as much as I love my kitties. Um, that disruption can be significant. Um, and also, is it a regular sleep time, especially waking, which may seem counterintuitive, but one of the best ways to regulate our sleep is actually to get up the same time every morning. Now that varies greatly. It's a little bit like having jet lag consistently. The body just, just doesn't know what rhythm to hit. And so the anchor point actually is getting up regularly, even on weekends, as hard as that can be. It's not to say you can't enjoy an occasional sleep in, but getting up the same time every day is a really, really important for regulating sleep cycles. And even if it's your sleep deprived at Saturday morning and you're like 7 a.m., I'm so exhausted, I haven't got enough sleep all week, get up at seven, put around for a little bit, then go back to bed and have a nap. That would be better to just anchor that sleep time as best you can. 
hormones, whole nother, this could be a whole nother talk, but just to say thyroid can play a, a big r role in, uh, in mood, particularly a low functioning thyroid tends to cause more depression or low mood symptoms. And a thyroid that's overacting can tend to cause panic or anxiety or aggravate it. But even a low thyroid, again, which I said was more, tends to cause more depressive symptoms. Everything kind of slows down. Body weight tends to go up. Everything just kind of goes, um, you can get more swelling in the body. Um, it can also cause anxiety symptoms in some patients, um, even though classical symptoms are more depression because the two can be quite interlinked as I've already alluded to earlier. Uh, and, and women more so than men, estrogen and progesterone balance or being low can play a big role in mood. Uh, it's particularly significant if your periods are irregular or if you're going in perimenopause or menopause, this is something worth looking at to help improve symptoms. I've certainly had patients who are just improving their progesterone levels, for instance, uh, anxiety significantly decreased or even went away rapidly. Now that's not always going to be the case, but you know, if someone where that is the major factor for them, it can be a really quick thing. That's the great thing about hormones is when you get the right, when you test and see that something is out of alignment or is out of balance or low, and then you put the right amount in to support that, you can have a really quick response, which can be a huge relief if you've been suffering from anxiety or depression for a long time, if it is indicated. So uh, would take a look at those. And sometimes even counterintuitively, those can apply to men as well, progesterone. Sometimes I use in male patients because there can be low pathways there and men do form some estrogens and progesterones. It's part of our natural body. Of course, we form more testosterone, which is a little more crucial to men and tends to influence mood more. Again, could be anxiety or depression, a little bit more depression if testosterone is low. Um, it's not really talked about as much, more so now, but uh, it's not talked about as, as same uh, women going to menopause, but men go into something called andropause. Usually it's a little bit later, so more in the 60s, but it could occur earlier as well. And it tends to be a little more subtle and gradual. Uh, and optimizing testosterone is really important. And the, the funniest, uh, inac it's a little inaccurate, but it's a funny way to remember it. Uh, from one of my teachers, they said, the difference between a man who goes into his old age, like into grandfatherly age uh, with good testosterone versus poor is that the, the man who has good testosterone levels for that age, like an optimal level is probably a happy old, happy old man, happy grandpa. Whereas someone who has low testosterone is probably a grumpy old grandpa. So, you know, it's not to say it'd be the only factor. So I said it's a little inaccurate, but um, it certainly can play a role in a really big role in men and, and a lesser role in women too. Just low testosterone can impact mood, uh, energy levels, muscle recovery, and certainly libido in women as well. So it plays a role in both men and women to, in that regard. Cortisol, which is our main stress hormone, if that's out of balance or low, that can really cause low mood, fatigue, and lots of other symptoms uh, and contribute to depression. Um, and finally, insulin, our blood sugar hormone, the hormone that shuttles away, sends a signal to shut away sugar into our cells when blood sugar rises, and that's out of balance. Now that can cause a big impact on mood and really a roller coaster uh, on mood. One thing I always like to ask is, how's your blood sugar? And most of us will say it's fine. Yeah, hopefully that's true of everyone here. You know, your blood sugar levels, if you had them tested, are good. But here's the deeper question for you to ponder. Is your blood sugar really optimal? And how can you tell that? What happens if you miss a meal? what happens if you miss a meal? Do you tend to be okay? Like, yeah, you're a bit hungry. Maybe you feel a little bit, you know, like a little bit lack of focus, but then are you okay overall? Can you function to the next meal? And if the answer is no, that you do not have optimal blood sugar levels. Now there's always exceptions to that, right? If you just, if you have a really intense workout that day, or you're under a lot of stress, then take that guideline with a little bit of a grain of salt. But in general, if, all, if you're having a kind of an average day, uh, are you able to skip a meal and feel relatively okay minus being hungry? Like you can still function and focus. Uh, to the next meal, because healthy blood sugar, really healthy blood sugar levels should be able to do that. And if you can't, then there may be some room for optimization there. I uh, know, of course, if anyone here is pregnant or has other blood, significant blood sugar issues uh, that they're aware of, then uh, don't take that challenge up without supervision from your doctor. Uh, but for anyone who doesn't, then consider that a, a test. Gut problems can play a huge role in mood, as I mentioned earlier it's the second brain in the body. We absorb all of our nutrients, all the medicine we take in the form of nutrients and food has to pass through our gut. And the gut is such an integral role as we're learning more and more. Our microbiome, if it's unhappy, so all the, the trillions 
of bacteria living in your gut are out of balance and not being well taken care of, and there are a bunch of more bad tenants than good tenants there, they can absolutely directly make you unhappy, which I said there to be kind of cute, but anxiety or depression can be triggered by, by gut irritation. So if you're experiencing any ongoing gut symptoms, gas blowing, diarrhea, irritable bowel uh, syndrome or disease, that is something that needs to be addressed. And it's definitely going to play some role, if not a significant role on your mental health. When I was younger, um, I, I would, I had irritable bowel like sim symptoms, lots of stress went to my gut. I got lots of aggravation there and uh, my mood would get, my anxiety would get super flared up um, when my gut was unhappy. In fact, I didn't really, I was hard to disentangle the two because they were, I mean, and they were intimately linked. Uh, for me, that's the way that the, the, two, the, the, two, the two systems would fall together. Uh, and I can say that uh, having healed my gut well over 15 years ago, uh, my, my mood, uh, minus, you know, aggravations during this pandemic, but overall my anxiety and, and tendency towards any depression has been greatly, massively more stable and improved. So it's a huge anchor. Um, and things to explore there, I listed some things like allergies and insensitivity, sensitivities or intolerances, you know, there's autoimmunity or an autoimmune trend there. These are all things to look at. And now there's lots of great testing uh, there that can be done. Uh, but if you're experiencing symptoms, that's something that we'd want to correct. You know, in, in natural medicine, we look at the gut as the center of everything. It's, it's how you absorb nutrients, how you nourish your body and brain. Um, and you're a bit more esoterically, you know, if you can take those in and use them, then that speaks to how you can sort of take in process the world. And if you're not even able to process your own foods, then it's going to be so much harder to process, take in, integrate the world around you as well. So it can become overwhelming really easily. So we want to have that core center of good nutrition be a part of daily living because it's crucial. And this links, this links to chronic inflammation, inflammation in our gut. You know, if you're getting heartburn and digestion, constant ongoing problems there, not just occasionally, like ongoing, consistent, severe aches and pains in our gut, it's going to link to, it's going to cause neuroinflammation as well. There's lots of big medical studies coming out about this and us naturopaths are like, yes, it's about time. And like, yeah, like good, thing, also kind of good. You kind of, you're kind of catching up finally, but disruption in our, in our gut can cause disruption in our brain. Uh, this was one study I quoted from Nature just from last year. It says, growing evidence indicates a reciprocal relationship between low-grade systemic inflammation, low-grade systemic inflammation and stress exposure towards increased vulnerability to neuropsychiatric disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder, which is one of the more severe ones to have PTSD as a very significant um, disruption that comes with depression and, and hypervigilance and um, something that Prolong, it, this is sort of acknowledging too that prolonged stress can lead to not just uh, si single, single or multiple si significant acute traumatic events. Certainly, the, the arena which we hear about more about PTSD is in, in, in veterans who've gone to war, uh, first responders who've seen you know horrific traumatic events are the more likely to see it. But we're now recognizing and acknowledging that this can occur under any, any ongoing severe significant stress over time, that there can be a post-traumatic stress disorder that can arise. Uh, and gut inflammation will contribute. It is part of that. The fire that will burn uh, in the gut can burn in the brain as well. So it's really, really crucial to improve digestive function and have brain health, uh, including anxiety and depression, be course corrected and improved. Infection, here it's, I'm not gonna go into this uh, too much, but just to say there are certain infections that absolutely can cause inflammation of the brain or irritation of the nervous system and then can cause, um, be a uh, physiological cause or trigger for anxiety or depression. Uh, classically, things like Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses, but even more common things like herpes virus that if the system can't quite keep can't keep it under control or it keeps flaring up. So uh, something as simple as, as repeated cold sores, um, Epstein Barr virus, which the mono could all be potentially linked if your immune system is unable to handle them or keep them under under control. Um, these can then actually affect and irritate the nervous system and sometimes in subtle ways and sometimes in profound ways and be an actual underlying cause of anxiety or depression symptoms. Uh, and fungus or molds, 
which is something I've uh, been focusing on the last few years, can also be a cause of the nervous system aggravation and, and these mood changes. So depression can also occur secondary to other conditions. I already mentioned hormones, low thyroid or hypothyroid, but it also can occur if anyone's experienced a stroke or heart attack or, or even a, a transient ischemic attack, which is sort of like a minor possible precursor to a stroke. Uh, you know, anything that's ir disrupting blood flow in the brain and causing irritation or damage um, can then cause depression uh, or potentially anxiety symptoms. Um, trauma, Trevor was talking a little bit in the PTSD there, and then other dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so forth. And as I already mentioned, uh, gut problems like irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel diseases, uh, a little <laughs> IBS, IBD, and ay, ay, ay. Um, it's a little humor for you there. I think I'm funny sometimes. And other things that are not just illness related, but I'd say are secondary causes of depression, like second, depression is secondary to in particular, are toxins. So a whole list of toxins here, I'm not gonna read them all aloud, but heavy metals are one that most people haven't considered before, unless they've come to see me or seen another naturopathic doctor, but things like lead and mercury, which we get small levels of in our water and food supply all the time uh, on the West Coast, you know, uh, seafood, can have mercury in it, depending on what it is. Big fish like tuna um, will have the most amounts. And I'm not saying don't eat seafood. I think there's there's way more benefit in eating fish like salmon, uh, trout, you know, more local coastal fish, and smaller fish like sardines. Um, I think there's way more value than the small amount of metals you get in them. But you may want to consider if you're eating a lot of tuna or swordfish or big migratory fish um, and are experiencing anxiety or depression, then this is something you ought to get consider getting tested for to see if your levels are high because uh, it's it's not it's pretty common to have high levels and you know getting them out can actually make a significant difference. I've heard it from a few patients with anxiety actually where we worked on their diet and see these pieces we've talked about already uh, and they said you know I've heard of them say we got I got sixty or seventy percent better which is great like super happy about that that's awesome and sometimes for a few of them it's it's then clearing out things like lead and mercury and just getting their body detoxifying all other toxins out of the system can bring them that to that 100%. Um, and so it can be real, really important. And if levels are really high, it may be a primary cause. Uh, ethanol, which is just alcohol, uh, you know, a glass of wine a day is fine. If that's what you enjoy. I encourage red, sorry for the white wine drinkers out there. Uh, just the resveratrol and goodies in it are, are a little bit better for us, uh, arguably, but uh, you know, a glass of, of any wine is fine, but if we're drinking more than that or becoming dependent on it, and that can be a real issue and it depletes our B vitamins in our system and, and you know, true alcoholism or long, long term heavier drinking can have bigger impacts. And a framework I'd put, it, context you know i think people don't often don't realize where the strain from alcohol can occur and that it's just so common for us to drink uh, maybe arguably a little bit more than we should uh because it's a social cultural norm and we think of alcoholism as full-blown they're drinking bottles of, of booze a day which is certainly a big problem but all it takes on on the average woman is about two drinks or more two servings or more a day and in men about three servings or more a day and that difference is just solely based on average body weights so to, um but that's not a lot you know it, and it's not to say you know so sort of do the math there on average if you're drinking as a woman if you're drinking more than 14 servings uh single servings a week and men seven to 21 or more uh this is something you should consider uh you know having some more booze-free days or have, if you really enjoy the taste, you know, an alcohol-free, uh, just mixing it up and, uh, and giving your liver and body a little bit of a break there. I'm not a no teetotaler. I definitely enjoy some, some wine on occasion. Um, uh, I'm going to be lying if I said I had enjoyed it a little bit more uh, during some of these dark months in the winter during the pandemic, but uh, just being really conscientious about that and, and having a, an honest inquiry if that's something that's going on for you. And then, and then getting support if it's something you're struggling with um, be really valuable. And if you're just enjoying glass or two and within that range, you may want to consider a good B vitamin or eating B vitamin rich foods to help counterbalance the alcohol and lots of fluid, lots of water to just help flush the system. Uh, other things like glutamate, you should find an MSG uh, or something 
that you might want to consider. Uh, my co comment on Botox there is, is just more of a joke. You know, if you're getting so much Botox, you can't even smile. Smiling, even if we don't feel happy, actually can induce hormone and endorphin release that makes us feel happier. So one annoying thing, if you're feeling low, repressed, is actually smiling. Smiling more, laughing more, even if you don't feel it, it actually can boost mood uh, to some degree. Uh, so uh, sorry if the Botox is inhibiting that. Uh, maybe don't get those those uh, muscles uh, Botox next time if you're someone who's doing that. And you may notice some improvements, some minor improvement there uh, in how you're feeling if you can smile more. Uh, lots of medications can be linked to, to depression or low mood. Um, common ones that I'll point out here is, uh, I don't think it's used so much anymore, but isotretinoin is an acne medication that used to be used. Um, so more for more the teenagers and adolescents uh, that you know, or if you are one of those. Oral contraceptive pills or birth control uh, can, for some women, cause depression. It's still not very well recognized. They even find some, some of the women's health clinics, and I've seen it a few times in young women. Where, and it's very clear they're doing, they're on a previous birth control. They were fine, and then they switch, and there's a clear ten, trend towards significant depression for them. It's not to say it might not be coincidental timing, but um, you know, but I've seen it at least twice where that change was very clear and then switching birth control, not even going off it, then improve the mood. So there's clearly for some uh, a strong correlation there. Um, some medications can be linked for blood pressure. It's, that's more loose, like beta blockers. It's probably more minor. So when, wouldn't, you know, unless you notice a big mood change in adding in a blood pressure med, I, it's probably not too likely. Uh, but other ones here that are pretty common are statins that help lower cholesterol. Um, they can cause low mood, so heads up there because they're given out like candy. And I think that's one medication where I'd say there's lots of natural and naturopathic interventions there that can make such a big difference, so much more than statins. And, and overall, I think statins are fairly safe for most people, but just if you're experiencing depression, it's something you may want to consider, especially if you're on a big dose of it. Or I've had a dose change recently and noticed that trend. Uh, and then proton pump inhibitors is it's really rare. There are stomach acid suppressing medication, which I don't like for other reasons, except in very short-term use. Um, they really are not good for absorbing minerals in the body and they cause all sorts of other disruptions and have real significant risks over time. Um, but as far as direct depression, they're, as a known cause, they're pretty rare. Uh, anyways, other ones there that you may want to, you may want to explore if you're experiencing depression or anxiety. You know, let your ND know what medications you're taking and have a frank discussion about that because there may be some adjustments there. They don't necessarily mean changing the meds or going off them completely, but uh, I guess I should say changing it. Yes, there may be an adjustment in dose or some supports that could go in place. Um, but not, so there's definitely supports that can occur there. It's something we need to consider. Uh, and then nutrient deficiencies can be really linked to low mood um, or depression. Here in particular, B vitamins like vitamin B9 folate and vitamin B6 play a big role in depression, but any of the B vitamins being low could be uh, playing a role. And then vitamin D, old sunshine vitamin, uh, can also cause low mood like I was mentioning earlier, it can be is linked to seasonal affective disorder and can be a contributing factor uh, to depression. Uh, you know, so it's something we want to take a look at. And uh, I'll say there is uh, we don't test it anymore. The average Canadian has deficient vitamin D levels, so every adult, even Health Canada, recommends every adult take vitamin D in Canada. You will not likely get anywhere near an optimal amount, even if you're a sun worshiper who is out in the sun with you know lots of skin exposure whenever it's sunny. Uh, for the most part, you're still probably going to be low on your vitamin D levels. And to be a, the difference between sufficient uh, level, I mean, just out of deficiency and optimal is almost uh, is almost twice is, is a significant difference. So the, the level I like to see my patients at, if you, if you know vitamin D levels, is around 130 to 150. The average Canadian has a level of about 55 to 60. And sufficiency, meaning you just, you're out of deficiency, just is at 75. So I'd say it's almost double that where most people want to lie. So, and the way we know that is by testing and, and, and adjusting dose, because that can be very individual. But for the vast majority of Canadians, I would say with a lot of confidence and seeing thousands and thousands of tests, vitamin D tests, that 99% of us are not getting adequate vitamin D by taking one drop or a thousand IUs a day. Not enough.
it's a, it ha, it's, it's very much has to be weight based. And then there's individual uh, pieces to it. And, you know, there's people like me who are rather, rel relatively lean and I needed, I need like five to 6,000 IAs a day consistently to maintain optimal levels. Um, and that may not be true for other people in my body weight. And there may be others who even need more. So it's, there's some variability there that, you, you know, will be explored in a, in a visit and with testing with your ND, if that's something you need to optimize. Uh, and then a few key minerals, iron, which most commonly we know about in, in anemia, which is more common in women, menstruating women, because of course the iron loss during menstruation um, should be looked at. Iodine, which has a huge role with thyroid health, as well as selenium uh, and zinc. I think those are all ones that are linked to mood. I'd say of them, the iron and iodine, the two eyes are the most crucial for, for um, depression and to lesser degree anxiety. All right, uh, I'm not gonna go too, too much into genetics, just to say now as an introduction for those who are new to this, that we now have all this growing ability to test different genome, uh, different genetic patterns. Uh, we call them SNPs, SNPs. We call it SNPs is a shorthand in, in, the, in the medical community, and that stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. So you don't have to remember that. Called a SNP. And what that means is, what's your individual way or your your individual part of your genetic code that deals with certain nutrients, that deals with with how you make and break down neurotransmitters. Again, our brain chemicals like serotonin, and how do you deal with detoxifying chemicals like lead and mercury, mercury, those are all really crucial things to know. And we're starting to see that in this age of individualized medicine. You know, there's more data emerging, the validity of it, like the, the, the level of evidence for it is increasing and how they interact with each other, the, the nuances of that is all being improved. But that is a very, this is a very deep, deep topic. I just want to point out that how you use the nutrients in it as, as, in, as an individual, how your neuro, individual neurotransmitters work and how you detoxify things are all intimately linked to anxiety and depression. They all play a really, really important role. Um, and so uh, if you're experiencing anxiety or depression, these are tests that you may wanna consider. And there's lots of private tests available, but it's something that a lot of people may not know is that you can actually use the raw genetic data from a test like 23andMe or Ancestry.ca and uh, give it to a, an ND like me. And we can put that raw data into a medical system that or program that will provide data about you know, the nutrients, neurotransmitters, and detoxification pathways that I've listed here in a lot more, um, in a much more robust way than say like the 23andMe health panel you know, will provide. It's very, that's very general. And of course, with any health data like that, you just because something comes up, it really requires some context and interpretation from a medical professional um, because just because there's genetic um, pattern there doesn't mean it's necessarily relevant to you um, in the in the moment or, or maybe ever. So there's real context that needs to be investigated. And I think it's really exciting. We're seeing this more with like individualized medicine. You know, I, I expect there'll be a day in the future where we can, we'll have this data and uh, not in a creepy Gattaca way, I mean, you know that movie, uh, but in a way that we'd be able to, we would know when your doctor is prescribing you a medication or your naturopathic doctor is recommending a nutrient or a, a supplement for you, that we would know these pathways. We'll know which ones needs more support and what that dosing will look like for more, more for you as an individual. And just from a safety perspective, if we know some of these pathways, the likelihood of an adverse response to say certain drugs in particular, we'll have a better idea if we know some of these pathways. So it's exciting that these are emerging and more, more information is coming through there. And last but not least is social isolation. Who here has felt more isolated, alone, trapped in the winter, uh, throughout the winter here, or just, and throughout this pandemic? I mean, this has been going on since March. Uh, to various levels of lockdown and, and isolation and social distancing. Uh, and as social beings that derive pleasure and meaning uh, and a deep sense of who we are and, and our community of, through connection, uh, that's been really impaired. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's great we have technology where we can stay connected, but it is, I would say, to be a bit dramatic, it's a bit of a shadow of actually being in person, to, to be in person in person with people um make those connections read their gestures you know all the things we take our system takes in uh, 
is really regulating to our nervous system for being with other people that we enjoy the company of. Everything from smell, sight, sounds, all that is something we take in and that uh, we don't currently have as part of Zoom technology. Maybe there'll be a new one where you can have all the, <laughs> all the connections. But even then, uh, we would know. We would know it's not the same as being in person. So, um, you know, that's been something we've all been struggling through and, uh, you know, dealing with in different ways and, and having bubbles in different social bubbles in different ways. And, uh, you know, I think all doing our best uh, through this to, to reduce the risk of spreading this significant illness that's COVID and, uh, and maintaining our sanity through it. So, um, Social isolation is a big issue, you know, um, and even knowing we saw in the stats I showed earlier that younger folks are seeing more anxiety and depression, statistically anyway, uh, than, than the elderly. Of course, elderly are already more prone to social isolation due to mobility, due to the fact that, you know, lack of proximity to, to friends and family or, or even some of their friends uh, passing on uh, as they get older. So it's a big issue and it, it impacts everything, I think. Sometimes we don't realize how much so, and, and it's interesting how we can normalize something that's, I mean, is really abnormal and, and hopefully will remain abnormal in the future for us. But uh, the way we've been operating and, and how the world has changed, uh, and what the new normal will be is all emerging. But we know, medically speaking, and from a research perspective, that social isolation plays a bit, has a big impact on all health outcomes. It, 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 it impairs everything. It, it's, it's part of us being thriving human beings so i just want to acknowledge that this has been a real challenge to for all of us and you can see a list there that everything from from mood like depression to sleep quality to our ability to, to focus and concentrate and, and just like store memories is impacted by by a disconnection from people uh, and you know, something I always like to point out too is that like social media is a bit of a misnomer and I'm not discouraging people from, you know, staying connected and on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is you like to use right now. Um, but I would say again, that's it, it is a way to maintain some contact and initiate more meaningful contact and like a video call or hopefully, you know, social distance walk in the park or having someone in your bubble. Uh, that social media is not the same as social connection it is not the same as social connection. Actually interacting with someone one-on-one -on -one is not the same as posting or writing comments. And you know, those are very different. And it's, we thrive and require actual social connection um, that social media is not providing. And if anything, I think the concern, my concern is with it is that sometimes um, it, it becomes a substitute for it. And so I just, you know, caution caution you to, or, and invite you to bring caution about that and, and bring some awareness to that uh, i think it's for some of the younger generations where that's just something that's it's like a default everyone you have your facebook page you have your instagram you have whatever the social um, uh, social media presences you have uh, that's something that's so ingrained uh, and it can be you know when used when you're using it and, and using it to connect more meaningfully I think that's great um, but it can be a real time suck and uh, <laughs> for people uh, and it can detract or distract from actually meaning making meaningful connections and even push some people into unhealthy you know relationships from from um, obsessive checking, which would feed anxiety to, to social value being applied to it, which again, anxiety and depression can be fed, it like can be, um, can be really fueled by, can be really aggravated by with unhealthy connections there. I mean, we, we're dealing with a social media landscape where there's literally algorithms and things like Facebook that are there to provoke you. They're there to get you annoyed, to make you really like happy. It's cute kittens or, oh God, that person's an idiot. How could they say that? That's purposely done. That is by design to get you to engage, to make you feel a strong emotion. Uh, and uh, I would say that sometimes we're, we're being manipulated uh, in ways that are subtle and not so subtle. And they, you know, there are suggestions that could be harmful to our mental health, especially if it's at the cost of making other connections, doing more meaningful things uh, in our life. Like if it's distracting us from work or from family time, from taking up a hobby where we're actually using our hands or mind to create something instead of just adding words, adding text to the wall, the giant wall that is the internet of text. And again, I, again I'm not opposed to its uh, sensible use, but it's just something that connectivity is not the same as connection. So I just want you to 
to consider that, you know, if you're feeling, hmm, yeah, maybe I do use that a little too much, or maybe I'm feeling too, just aggravated, but, you know, and feeling compelled because of, because uh, someone's pissing me off on, on social media, maybe a sign that a little less of that uh, would be really good for your, your mental well-being. So let's talk about some solutions here. Let's get out of this depression uh, and anxiety. So again, we want to, as much as possible, identify and correct underlying causing causes. That's one of the six principles in naturopathic medicine. We want to treat you as an individual and then identify the actual causes because that's the most efficient way of doing it. It's all fine to put a Band-Aid on a wound, but if you still have splinters in, or dirt in your wound, then the Band-Aid's probably not the best choice, although it may play a short-term role. Um, or as I said, the other analogy here is when in doubt, put out the fire before repairing your house. Good idea. So vitamins and minerals, uh, we wanna make sure we're optimizing levels of iron, iodine, selenium. Now some of these you can test for in a basic blood panel from Life Labs, and it's certainly something I do or, or look at those levels. Um, but what you can also do with, with a more nuanced eye is you can look at some of the levels of things like just like your basic blood counts and markers that aren't, aren't directly about vitamins and minerals and infer that you may have deficiencies uh, or imbalances in, in these levels. So basic blood work uh, under uh, a more experienced integrative doctor's eye or naturopathic doctor's eye can really see a lot and infer a lot because um, not all these can be readily tested or, or uh, uh, tested without a high expense. So, uh, you know, having most people have had, can get a basic life labs panel from the doctor, or I can order one for, for a very low uh, amount. And we can really start to see, are these minerals or vitamins low? And which ones? And then let's focus on those so we can give you the best remedy. And there certainly is no harm for the most part in adding most of these in. I would say the only thing you want to be cautious of, of these lists of vitamins and minerals uh, would be iron, because we don't want to overload anyone with iron. That can actually be inflammatory. Um, over time and, and, and aggravate certain situations. But if you know your eye levels are low because you've had a blood test or say have a heavy menstrual uh, cycle, uh, then, then it certainly is very reasonable to be taking in uh, additional iron as needed until those levels are optimized. And one thing I mentioned here about magnesium and zinc, uh, your fun fact is magnesium is the most common macro mineral deficiency. What I mean by that, it's one of those, like it's not a trace mineral, it's a big mineral. We all get it in our diet to some degree, but it's the most common one when tested, blood levels are tested in North America, around 50% of people have suboptimal to deficient levels. So again, yeah, extra magnesium is important. Uh, it and zinc stimulate something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And that's really important for the brain, brain well-being and health. And uh, having that a good BDM, BDNF levels can lower risk uh, or severity of anxiety and depression. And two, one more comment here I want to say about B vitamins. I mentioned here specifically methylfolate and methyl or hydroxycobalamin, which are vitamins B9 and 12 in their active forms. That's key, active forms. You want these active forms that when they hit the bloodstream, they're ready to go. Your body can use them. They're so important. I've seen anxiety, depression um, improve with just getting a good amount of methyl folate, even when someone was already taking folate by itself. Uh, and here's something I just learned recently um, in a talk ironically called Unimportant Molecules by the great Dr. Joe Pizzorno, sort of in brackets, unimportant. Um, it, it, that some of these um, vitamins like the vitamin B9 and B12 are really, really important to get in these active forms and from diet. Like it's both important to get both, but you may want to hedge your bets or if your levels are low to get a, a good active supplement. And on the flip side, if you're taking a supplemental form of say, say just folate, it's not, a, it's not methylfolate, it's just plain old folate or folic acid. Over time, there actually may be a, a some small amount of risk to that. Uh, and it's unclear how, how big or how many individuals, but actually may do the opposite of what you expect. It's not entirely, it may not be entirely harmless. There may be some risk associated. So if you're gonna spend any money on a multivitamin uh, or B vitamin uh, or B complex, get these active forms. You're wasting your money and may actually be causing some minor risk to yourself if you're getting any other form. The only, other, the only reason other forms are used is because uh, the companies are cheap. That's it, they're just saving money and providing you a lower quality of something that may not work as well. And in some individuals, may actually be mildly harmful, which is, which is disturbing. Uh, but thankfully there's lots of great 
brands now that contain the active B vitamins. Uh, and a great way to tell if you have all the active B vitamins, if someone has methylfolate, which is B9, and methyl or hydroxycobalamin, then they almost certainly have all the active B vitamins because it's kind of all or nothing. Because if someone has, is, has the ethics and, and knowledge to put in those active forms, they're definitely gonna put them all in. So it's a good little quick reference if you're looking at on your multivitamin or, or, or B vitamin uh, at home after this now, or when you go to the store, then see if it has either of those forms and if it doesn't, find another one. And then vitamin D3, it's important to supplement with it. Um, a little pro tip during this pandemic is uh, you can go pretty high dose with it. Uh, there's a study that uh, came out partly out of the University of Calgary or partly Corin, showing that at 10,000 IUs or 10 drops a day uh, for about, you know, around if you're getting cold or flu um, for three days at least, you can uh, rev up your immune system by taking that dose. I'd say for three days, it's safe for anyone. Um, unless you've recently been taking big doses and tested to see you have high vitamin D levels, which is pretty rare, but it can happen. Um, but short term, uh, even if you've been taking a steady dose, if you're starting to feel sick, then taking a bigger dose for a couple, three days, you know, two, three days uh, is good for the immune system. That's uh, what I did or do when I get sick. Uh, that's what I uh, will do before I get my COVID vaccine, just to make sure my, one of the ways I make sure my immune system is all revved up to end to go. So some herbs that can help here with mood here, I'm focusing more on the depression again, uh, or low mood. St. John's wort um, has had sometimes mixed result or mixed impressions. It said, oh, it's not worthwhile. There's studies saying, oh, no, no, it doesn't really work. And it's, it's not the right herb for major depression. So if someone has a major depression and or there's other underlying symptoms or causes too that we've explored, then it's not gonna be the right, it may not be the best choice, but it, from mild to moderate depression, it can be very effective. And so it's just knowing to when, when to use, the, when what, what is the right remedy at the right time and the right dose. Here's St. John wort, Swartz, St. John's wort is a good choice if your depression is, is newer and we just, and it's just, you would describe it as more mild to moderate and it would be a good herb or part of a good plan for you. Rhodiola can be safe for anyone to take. It's very energizing and it can help lower anxiety. It's a great high mountain flower. Um, also good for increasing activity and, and endurance. So you've been sort of slumped and not moving as much by this pandemic, then rhodiola may not only help boost your mood, but help get you back into a regular movement or exercise routine. Saffron has quite a bit of really powerful data for it. It's a quite expensive uh, culinary herb, uh, but it's a really powerful antioxidant and also can boost libido. So maybe a good choice if you're finding uh, that uh, libido has also been impacted by low mood for you. Uh, and saffron you can get as a, as a medicinal herb. It's a little more expensive, but not, I would say, comparatively, comparatively expensive to using it as, as a spice, um, if, you're, if you're comparing spices to spices. Uh, so something to consider if you haven't heard about saffron, so either remedy with it or it by itself could be really powerful. 5-HDP um, is a nutrient. It is a building block or one of the early building blocks of serotonin in the body. And serotonin, again, is really, really important for anxiety or depression. Um, just caution, you know, get, get a naturopathic doctor's advice in dosing and mon to monitor you if you're already taking a medication that's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, or serotonergic norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, or SNRI. Um, just because we don't want to, if, those, if, they're, if you're on a really high dose of those, we want to be careful not to bump your serotonin levels too high because there can be significant risks to that. But for anyone not taking those medications, it's a fairly, it's a very safe remedy to take. Um, and again, it could be very, it can be very beneficial if you're experiencing sleep disruption, uh, because again, it's going to help replete not just serotonin, but also help with that serotonin steal, melatonin levels. And uh, you know, it's, if you're going to get a serotonin hit before bed, it's going to make you feel a little bit more satiated, a little more calm, a little more, uh, it's going to certainly improve the likelihood that your sleep is going to be better quality. Um, and then last one here, um, I don't actually use that much for myself at the moment, but uh, I'm always reminded of it and like the data on it. It's called SAMe. Uh, a little harder one to find, but uh, if you're experiencing arthritis and low mood, it could be a good choice because it has some very good data for improving arthritis symptoms. Uh, and SAMe um, plays in some of the pathways as the active B vitamins. Uh, so it really helps with neurotransmitters, mood and energy, and is a very safe uh, nutrient to take, even if it's a little hard to find. 
For inflammation, now you're feeling lots of systemic aches and pains, your gut's always upset, your joints are always upset, uh, or you've tested high on some a marker, like say your C-reactive protein or CRP on a life lapse test, um, then we want to put that fire out. And I would say when we're talking about inflammation that's affecting the brain as well, curcumin goes top of the list, which is the active ingredient from turmeric, the Indian spice. Uh, certainly, if it's something you want to cook with and eat with healthy fats and some pepper every day, you can actually get a therapeutic amount of curcumin if you're having it daily. Um, but if you're not that keen into uh, making that many curries or drinking golden milk, which is uh, turmeric powder, coconut milk, and usually a bit of honey or a sweet, natural sweetener, uh, then you can certainly get it. curcumin, the active ingredient from turmeric in the capsules and forms that are highly available. And it does get to the, across the blood brain barrier. That's the triple B there. So it gets into the brain. And it can be quite fast acting within 15 to 20 minutes. Now, if it's been ongoing inflammation, like if you're, to be clear, if you have low mood or depression, likely there's been ongoing chronic inflammation there. And so don't expect simply putting the inflammation out or lowering it acutely in the brain to cause an immediate mood effect. It's always a possibility, but it's not so likely. Um, but on the plus side, if you're experiencing aches, pains, arthritis symptoms, the curcumin can help lower those uh, pretty rapidly uh, and then certainly over time to greater effect. Boswellia, which is Indian frankincense, is also a great anti-inflammatory that has effects on the brain. One of my colleagues and great mentor, Dr. Neil McKinney, who's in Victoria, uh, the cancer specialist, oh, I shouldn't say that, he's a, he's a special focus on cancer care as a naturopathic doctor. Um, um, he uh, has been known to say that it's uh, comparable to prednisone, which is a powerful uh, corticosteroid that ha can bring down inflammation anywhere in the body, including the brain. And certainly I'd say Boswell is a heck of a lot safer, not to say that prednisone doesn't have its place and it can be effective medicine when used, but it has some significant side effects to it, like uh, sw swelling in the body and uh, mood disruption and um, also immune, it lowers immunity as well. Uh, prednisone does not buzz well prednisone. So just a caution, anyone who's using that or has had to use it, uh, that there's some things that need to be supported there if you're, if you're required to be using it for whatever reason. Omega-3 uh, fatty acids also help lower inflammation, but it's not quickly. So to be clear, if you're trying to put out lower your inflammation level uh, with fish oils or uh, fish oil extracts, you're not going to do it in a day or even a week. It takes several weeks for the body to incorporate the fatty acids into the body and also requires a big enough dose. So for the most part, if you're just taking a fish oil capsule a day, you're not getting a therapeutic dose for inflammation or, or probably your brain. Um, you need to get at least two grams of EPA, which is the active anti-inflammatory part of it. And for optimal brain health for minimally 200 milligrams of DHA, but uh, 400 milligrams or more would be better. But again, these are slow acting and they're very, very important. So the DHA, which is more of a brain part of the fish oil, helps form the insulation around our nerves. So it's considered a little bit like the plastic that wraps the copper wire, uh, metaphorically speaking, of our nervous system. So that's really, really important. But again, not fast acting, but uh, is a good thing to add in for lots of reasons, uh, and including some studies showing, like medical, big medical studies showing that for anxiety in particular, omega-3s do show a significant impact uh, or benefit. Uh, but again, not fast acting, it takes a bit of time. Um, but more, very much worthwhile adding in. And if you're, you're a vegan or don't want uh, any fish in your diet, don't want to eat any fish or get some, anything from fish for other reasons, uh, then you can uh, take, lot, there's lots of uh, vegan forms now that are derived from algae. And that's where the fish ultimately get these omega-3 fatty acids. An anti-inflammatory diet, um, which I could elaborate on more. Uh, there's lots of vari variability in what that might equate to. Um, but, you know, usually involves lots of whole foods and removal of refined sugars and anything that's processed. Sometimes it will remove the nightshade family or limit the nightshade family plants like peppers, potatoes, and eggplants. Can they can be a little bit inflammatory if someone's already having an upset digestive system, which is not to say those aren't good foods and with the, for the right person or at the right time. But uh, if someone's really inflamed, they may be foods to temporarily remove. And then of course, to test for and eliminate any food allergies or sensitivities in the system, because those are both immune uh, modulated uh, or moderated uh, reactions that can cause inflammation, not just in the gut, but systemically, uh, and sometimes significantly in the brain to contribute to depression and anxiety. It's something I certainly found and have seen in patients that uh, anxiety was for me, when I used to have really bad digestion, was greatly triggered by my food sensitivities. So the inflammatory response from my gut 
to my brain would cause like fatigue, low focus, and then some, and, and it would make me super anxious, like just really like uh, very, very anxious. And uh, it's because my brain, my gut and my brains were being inflamed. And so guess what helped me put it out? Things like fish oils and, and turmeric were sometimes rapidly effective for me. Um, the, the, the turmeric part or the curcumin was rapidly effective and over time the fish oils. So I know we're going a little over time. We're almost at the end here. Another deep breath. So if you're experiencing anxiety or depression, then talk, talk or not talk therapies, because there's lots of therapies that um, help the mind, help, help, but don't necessarily require you to, to talk. It's not all, a lot, a lot of counseling now is not, it's certainly nothing to do. It's not psychotherapy. And even psychotherapy is not like, you know, the old Freudian, you're going to sit on the couch and tell me about your mother or tell you, tell you a lot. Now that kind of value, I think it's very important to have a safe place to share what, what is bothering us, what our emotion, what our emotions are to reflect uh, and, and have a, an unbiased person be able to hold that, hold that space for us, reflect back and allow us to sort of decompress and share uh, is super valuable. But for those who don't want to do that or as a part of a healthy plan for anyone who does want to do talk therapies, there are other therapies out there that don't require much communication uh, verbally anyway. Things like neurofeedback can be really important where you actually have these leads put on onto your head and uh, it analyzes your brain patterns and then over time it helps shift them in positive ways that, that, that have a lasting effect. Um, I have some colleagues who do that and have great effect for lots of conditions uh, including anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and, and other things unrelated like autism and so forth. Uh, so uh, and if you want to know more about that, you can ask me more. I just listed a couple of things about counseling, which is very broad. I realize that in neurofeedback, there's certainly way more in those in that bucket of therapies there. Um, and then movement, the cheapest thing, but also sometimes the hardest thing to do when we're feeling depressed in particular is to move. Um, because our, when we're not moving regularly, which has been, you know, I feel like that inertia was pandemic, right? Like exercise, movement, uh, and our last item there in sex life actually has all gone down. You might have thought, oh, well, people are in together and they're spending more time together. There's going to be a baby boom. There's lots going to be, you know, sex as therapy. And uh, although I hope that that is something you've had a healthy sex life during this, uh, you would, that has not been, the, on average, has been lower. Healthy uh, sex has been less. Uh, and exercise has tended to be less on average with folks. We've all sort of fallen into an inertia pattern. Uh, being stuck inside and not being able to do our normal things, uh, just feeling more barriers to going out and getting and doing them. And so I encourage us all to get some momentum. And the key to it is to start slow. Do not, if you haven't moved much and haven't done that big hikes, runs, jogs, swims lately uh, for weeks, months or longer, um, start back slowly. Do less than you think you can. Go for five minutes. It's one of those counterintuitive little tips that can be so, so valuable. Literally, you know, if you like, I've been meaning to run for this whole week and I haven't gone, then put your running shoes on, put your shorts on even before you're ready to go and, and then commit to only two minutes uh, and don't oh, try and overdo it. Yeah, if you're com compelled to do more, keep it short those first few times because the, the most important thing is to get up, start getting in the habit of going, showing up and doing it and feeling like you can do it the next time and not, I finally got out after not going out for that run for two weeks and I go for a big one, which I loved. And then I'm sore and achy and feel discouraged for days afterward. That's, that's, it's not it. We want to be able to show up every day and, and do some healthy movement. And it doesn't have to be anything I've listed. It could be Tai Chi. It could be going for a walk. At the end of the day, the most important cardiovascular exercise we can do, probably because it's most sustainable, and unless you're in a wheelchair or mobility issues, um, is the thing we can do for most of our lives is to walk, just to walk every day. And then it's a huge mood booster, huge, huge mood booster from depression. It just gets us going, gets all our endorphins running. It can help over time uh, lift our mood. Um, and it's, 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 it can be free. It just means you have to go outside and move or do whatever it is that get, gets you moving. And use some bribery here too, right? I mean, put on your favorite podcast, get an audio book, put on your favorite music. Bribe yourself to go and do it and make it really, really pleasurable and start small and then build from there. Regularity is the pattern, is the key. And then any self-expression or, or maybe you call them hobbies here, whether it's art, journaling, singing, dancing, 
play around, sing in the shower. These are all things that we can express ourselves, lifts our mood. So, so important. So we wanna move to be able to express ourselves. And finally, something I alluded to, which would probably be totally new to all of you. He says psychedelic assisted therapies. What is Pat? Psychedelic assisted therapies. This is something that is re-emerging. It had a uh, initial heyday and then, and then took a nose dive long ago to uh, psychedelic days, you know, the Timothy Leary's and, and uh, less controversial uh, research scientists that were of that time. Uh, and it's unfortunate that, uh, that it sort of got lost in the mainstream anyway and, and has so much stigma around it, but it is re-emerging. Um, I just thought this was a cool image and John Hopkins University launches Center of Psychedelic Research. Cool. Uh, and there's, so there's a lot of research that's been ongoing and more of it and more is emerging and it's showing a real promise. So this is a huge topic. Uh, I'll show you at the end of the talk, I'll put up a slide about one of my trusted friends and colleagues who's doing a talk, which we'll get much more into psychedelics, but just as a, a little bit of a primer slash worth considering if you're struggling with depression or anxiety, it'd be something to explore as this emerges. And to be really clear, I'm not legally allowed to recommend it, to prescribe it or facilitate at, at the moment as an astrophotic doctor, but I'm here presenting you the data and research and letting you know what's going on um, uh, as a therapy. And, and I, I feel now comfortable saying it's something that I have experienced myself and found it lifted me from a depression I was uh, not even aware I was in previous, a little bit previous to the pandemic. Um, uh, and it's, it was it's been it was exceedingly positive experience for me more than I expected and I came it was uh, coming from a from someone who's quite cautious concerned uh, and even a little bit anxious about it like what am I doing um, a good entry point if you're if this is new to you or just want a good primer is Michael Pollan's book how to change your mind he has uh, first the history of psychedelics including old history and, and current like the first wave of it in the new wave and then he talks about some of the the research and his own personal experience of as he puts it you know as uh someone who, who lived through the 60s but didn't take any psychedelics until he was over 60 years old so uh it's a really good honest uh and, and compelling account of of uh, this topic uh the thing the promise of them is that in for depression end of life anxiety arguably any anxiety but where the research is going is end of life anxiety um, sorry, I've repeated depression here. Uh, I think one of them is supposed to be treatment resistant depression, uh, meaning that's failed other drug therapies. And then addiction uh, could be anything from smoking alcohol to narcotics addiction. That the psychedelics, when used appropriately, are showing a really significant response. They can be fast and effective. I debated this slightly dramatic second point there about blows many traditional psychiatric medications out of the water. It's not to say that having other supports there and care isn't important, but there are there are uh, some really promising research studies showing people have been been stuck with these conditions and have seen little little um, improvement or little significant improvement from their medications or standard medications have had seen significant, sometimes life-changing shifts when using psychedelic assisted therapy. Uh, and, and that could be, you know, what, what we're going to see right now are things like ketamine, which is a, uh, uh, is an anesthetic. It's legal. It's the only legal, completely legal um, psychedelic um, in Canada in the, in the sense that it is a an anesthetic and off-label use for pain, um, but it actually can be used as a psychedelic because it has an effect similar in the same pathways as psychedelics. Psilocybin, which are magic mushrooms, MDMA, which commonly be known as, uh, as ecstasy, uh, and LS good old LSD, uh, all sort of the forefront of being um, studied and used in research studies that are ongoing uh, across the world, including at, here at UBC, um, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, just put one of many articles there that psilocybin and magic mushrooms for major depression. Uh, it was show, you know was showing some significant, uh, some significantly positive effects, and maybe a, a new and emerging treatment modality. I certainly think it's going to be, uh, and we're seeing some real shifts in the legal landscape, which I'll talk about next. The one thing I want to Emphasize here, if anyone here has tried or heard tales of psychedelics or tried magic mushrooms in their youth or, or not so youth, um, that is, a, although the, the remedy may be the same, um, the, uh, 
the, the set and setting of it are really crucial for a therapeutic result, meaning what is your mindset going into it and what is a physical and social setting. So, you know, what I'm talking about here is having a counselor or medical team that is, is going to guide you, is guiding you before into that experience and then afterwards to integrate a, a, and, and how that's being done you know, with, with music, a safe setting, supports, is, is, is very different. It creates a very different outcome than just using it recreationally. Um, and I think that's really, really important to know. Unless there's some other psychedelics there. Uh, one fun one that I like there is a fun fact is the over-the-counter medicinal mushroom, medicinal, not magical, lion's mane, which is great for memory, focus, and, and even stress, regulating stress. Uh, in big enough doses, which might be anywhere from three grams or more, an individual can actually have very mild very mild psychedelic effects. So uh, just a heads up if you're taking huge doses of lion's mane that uh, if you're noticing any altered state that you may be very sensitive to it and uh, just be aware of that. Uh, here's a, just a little research uh, summary of, of from Nature, the reputable journal Nature, showing what uh, psychedelics are being studied and you can see a huge bump in studies from 2010 to the last few years, 17 trials last year. Uh, 2021 already on track to exceed that. The little blocks show, uh, you know, blue is LSD, green, orange is MDMA, and psilocybin is gray. No ketamine ones in, in this list uh, anyway. And just really briefly, and then I'm going to be quiet until I have a question to answer, is the psychedelic legal landscape. What we're seeing in Canada anyway is that, uh, in BC, I should say, but Canada in general is that there's a shift in Health Canada to starting to allow um, increasing access to these. So a lot of people feel there's a tide change and that uh, we may either, we'll have, we'll have different access points. What that's going to look like exactly uh, over time will, is anyone's, anyone's guess. There's certainly predictions about that, but it looks like access is being granted uh, in these therapeutic contexts for, for our mental well-being. Uh, I'm very excited because about it from one perspective, because I see a lot of cancer patients to, for integrative care. Uh, and so for them facing end of life and then even their caregivers and the trauma they, they are dealing with, uh, there is, you know, may, this may be a real, when appropriately chosen and given the right context, maybe a really valuable tool or re remedy for them, which I'm really excited about. Um, so ketamine, again, uh, not, it's not illegal in Canada because um, uh, it's it's not a uh, uh, it's not listed as the other substances are, um, which is means it's probably going to be the fir first thing we're going to see some more movement on, which we've already seen in BC. Um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons has, has said that um, oral and nasal ketamine can be used in non-hospital facilities, and that's going to be for this use for for as a psychedelic for for mental health uses and also for chronic pain or off-label pain use which is a that's a shift in the in a positive direction in the us in 20 march 2019 it was already fda approved for treatment resistant depression and now more indications uh, have, uh, have appeared in the us uh, and some other things are happening is map uh, mdma training and research is occurring through maps canada which is an access organization um, for psychedelics and uh, something called the Section 56, which is physician access to uh, psilocybin and magic mushrooms, uh, which was initially granted for end of life, but we're starting to see some cases even open up for mental mental health um, beyond end of life. So uh, I think it was a treatment resistant depression case that was the first one that was non end of life. So we're seeing some really move, movement there and it's something that you may want to keep an eye on that may have some real promise when done appropriately. So thank you so much for being here and listening. I will take questions. Um, I would normally answer questions till the cows come home, but I do have to pick my son up from daycare, uh, which means I have to leave by five. So uh, I'll answer 11 minutes worth of questions. And if any more come are still un unanswered or not completely answered, you can fire and Nada. Nada can provide an uh, email or you can use the Better Now email address here to send those questions there. Or if you don't feel like asking a question that will be read read aloud um, or ask sort of semi-publicly here, then uh, feel free to send them uh, anonymously to the email listed on the page now. First of all, that was amazing. What a great deep dive into the topic. Thank you. That was just an excellent webinar. 
And we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is love hearing all the benefits of these vitamins and min minerals. Is there any harm done in taking as many as we can? I understand that there are tests that can be done, but for someone who is managing their depression decently, I just want to enhance my health. Is it okay to just take re recommended doses on the bottles without curating a specific plan? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I, I don't think you're going to do yourself any harm. You might not reach as an as optimal destination as if you get some guidance and, and have, uh, you know, take a look at some of the objective data like blood work um, and even just some of the nuances of, of the way you're experiencing depression or other symptoms related or unrelated to it. Um, would be able to finesse, you know, you may be able to finesse it, but the short answer is for the most part, as long as you're sticking to the recommended guidelines in the bottle, you, you can't go too far wrong. It's not, I can't blankly say it's always completely safe for everyone. You know, um, there are certain vitamins like the fat soluble ones where you have to be a little more cautious and certainly recommend more testing and guidance, certainly uh, if you're going out of the recommended guidelines. The, the, those are all meant to be very safe for the average person to take. So safety should be fine, but effectiveness may not be achieved because there's a there's a great difference between achieving a, like an, an, a safe level versus an optimal level when you're dealing with a, with a health concern. Thank you. And uh, from Shannon, what's beneficial about lion's mane? Why high dose is low dose good or I guess effective? That, that's also a great question. Thank you, Shannon. Um, lion's mane, I'm, I'm a bit of a mushroom fanatic, uh, medicinal mushrooms uh, and perhaps others. Um, so that's my little caveat. Um, I love them because, and lion's mane in particular, is because mushrooms are multitaskers. And what I mean by that is if you're going to take any supplement, I always like to choose one that can do as many things for you as possible, especially if it's relevant to you. So if you're, not you, but say someone is in front of me and they're stressed out, their focus and memory is really poor, and they're getting lots of colds and flus, I would say, hey, lion's mane would be a great choice because guess what? It helps regulate stress response. It uh, helps with focus and concentration because it increases something called uh, nerve growth factor in the brain, sort of like the, consider the gardener and, and nourisher of the brain. We want more of it, it's good. Um, and it also regulates our immune response. So if someone's immune system is low, uh, it will bring it back up to a regular level. And as far as we can tell when appropriately dosed, even if you're experiencing, have autoimmune condition or immune system that overacts, uh, you know, a good moderate, low to moderate dose of mushrooms is not going to provoke that at all. But you would, you do, would want to use caution depending on what mushroom, who's, who's, who you're getting it from, and the big doses uh, if you are in, in an auto, like an autoimmune flare-up, say like a rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, then you, know, you just be cautious um, there. So that's why I like lion's mane. Uh, but just again, as my comment, you know, if you're getting into three, four plus grams a day, which is a very big dose, it's like to be put in context, it's like 10, if you're taking capsules, it'd be like 10 capsules or, uh, you know, probably a good heaping teaspoon or more every day uh, of the powder, um, then it may have a mild psychedelic effect. So just uh, that may be a benefit to you, but you may also feel you're a little bit altered by that. So if you're planning to go there and you're new to it, then go gently and don't do it on a work day or a day where you're driving in traffic. Great. Well, we don't seem to have any more questions. I think that's because you explained everything so incredibly well. Great. You're all you're all NDs now. Awesome. <laughs> Just don't go pra don't go don't go practicing without a license. <laughs> so, uh, I've got your email address and your website up here. Is there another way to get a hold of you, or is that uh, that's that's the best way? They can better now at EmpowerHealth.ca is the best way to get a hold of me. Um, I am on Facebook and Instagram, but I don't use it very consistently. So. Don't expect me to answer there with any uh, any uh, r rapidly or even in a timely fashion. Sorry. Uh, so email would be best or call the office. Uh, and I just wanted to put up uh, the next slide uh, for anyone who wants to know more about psychedelics, uh, especially in Canada. Uh, there's another great webinar. I don't know if you want to give a little preamble to it, Nada, but I switched to that slide now, as you probably see. Yeah, um, it's yeah, it's our next. Uh webinar in the series and we're really looking forward to it. Um, so Dr. Patrick did uh, provide some information on this, but this is more about what's available in Canada. Um, the legal, you know, just the, the efficacy data, um, 
resources that are available right now, public access, legal parameters, and uh, we're really looking forward to that one too. You can register for that at uh, hands.org. Wonderful. I definitely recommend checking it out. I, I plan to. Uh, uh, Dr. Ray Sainarno is a trusted friend, colleague, and was a classmate of mine. So she'll be a great guide. And uh, I, although I haven't yet to meet Colleen Fish, I've heard only fantastic things about her. And I really love some of the work that MAPS Canada is doing. So I'm really excited that you're hosting that. And I hope those interested uh, or even newly interested in what I mentioned about psychedelics or outside of what I mentioned will, will join us on April 13th. Excellent. And finally, um, where's the other slide? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Sorry, that's slightly out of order. So, so, yeah, and don't forget, Hans is social. So, do like us on Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on Twitter. And uh, don't forget to sign up for news, Hans News and events at uh, hans.org. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's it, I think. So again, thank you so much. Amazing webinar. And thanks to everybody who participated. And um, if you have any questions, you can always contact me at info at hands, H-A-N-S dot org. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.